Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Eben here, and today I'm going to be walking you through a 30-minute landscape speed painting process uh, I created as part of the Weekly Evident Challenge. If you haven't checked that out, you should go check it out. I'll throw a link in the description below. And uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you to please like the video and subscribe and hit that bell so you don't miss new content coming out every Wednesday on this channel, as well as live streams that I do every Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And real quick, before we get started, I also just wanted to remind people that right now I am currently accepting students in the group session for the ESA Mentorship Program. Once again, you can find that link in the description below, and basically at the beginning of February I'm going to be accepting a small number of students into a group uh, course crash course session to improve your artwork and to connect with some fellow artists and we're going to be going over artwork each week and identifying ways that you can improve so if you want to take your artwork to the next level and really improve your skills and find out how you can improve your practice to get better results check that out in the link below Alright, let's get started and talk a little bit about what's going on in this painting here. So as you can see, I'm working in Procreate here, and uh, I'm starting a little bit differently than I usually do with a speed painting because I have a, an idea of the prompt. I do want it to be some kind of snowy scene, and so I'm starting out with a pretty clear color palette. And uh, knowing uh, as I do what, what kind of colors you'll generally see coming up in a snowy scene, uh, you'll see this nice dynamic between these warm uh, grays and whites and as also the, uh, the blue of the sky, which is sort of present uh, throughout the shadows in the snow layer. And uh, that's just something that I'm sort of starting to play up here just a little bit. And uh, I'm just sort of messing around with some different hues and uh, also loosely establishing a bit of perspective here as well as a skyline and I've created a bit of a gradient uh, along the upper uh, half to 60% mark of the painting just to indicate a general uh, atmospheric uh, uh, line across the horizon there going from a less dense atmosphere at the top to a more dense distant atmosphere at the bottom which tends to take on more light which will uh, give it a lighter value. And the next thing I'm doing here is just sort of exploring uh, what kind of distant object I can include here. When I started this piece I really had no idea where I was going with it, I had no plan, I had no sketches. It's just sort of the heart and soul of the speed painting process. It's just diving right in and putting paint down without any sort of uh, pre uh, cognitization. I don't know if that's the right word or even a word at all. But without the sort of um, planning, you know, you just you just get in there and you start making marks and you sort of bypass this this um, this sort of thinking and um, and uh, sort of this thought process that can really uh, sort of lock up uh, our gears sometimes when we first start out. And this is a really useful process for those of you who struggle to move past that first part of the painting to uh, if you struggle to create ideas from a blank canvas. I have plenty of other videos on this as well if you want to check those out. I'll include a link to those as well. But uh, I do speed paintings all the time. I incorporate it into my daily practice. And it's just a great way to get into that mindset of A, putting down the most important elements of a painting within you know your, thir your first 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, in this case, it was 30, I th think more like 35 minutes. And uh, two, it allows you to really uh, sort of uh, hone in on on your focal areas and to develop them and to to get in the, the right details and not all the details. So you can create a detailed painting uh, as a speed painting, but uh, it just means that you have to be very careful about the time you spend on those details. So for example, in this piece, I am starting out uh, probably with w too soon with some of these details here, but I also know that this is going to be my f going to be my focal area. So I'm really uh, not particularly concerned with what's happening everywhere else around here. 
and I just want to make sure that's firmly established because if I make if I develop this painting in this half hour and I don't have a focal area or something interesting or something to draw the eye uh, or at least one maybe even two or three but it's a little hard to set up in that time um, if I get to that point and I don't have that it's not going to be a finished product and uh, you really want to make sure you have some kind of uh, point of interest one or two or three even but at least one that you can really develop further and create some clarity around so what I'm doing with this little what ends up being sort of this uh, building out in the snow this old bunker or something that's just covered in snow here I'm just sort of messing around with it I'm playing out with it with a few different shapes and uh, with the the snow that's covering it and um, I haven't developed that uh, quite yet to the extent that I do uh, and later on you'll you'll see me go in there and start playing around with uh, some different places where the snow begins and uh, the building ends and so forth creating different shadows creating reflected light I've already included a little bit of that reflected light you can see right in the middle there I've pushed that shadow color a little bit to the warmer side and that's just where you can see the light bouncing off of the snow and hitting the wall where the light isn't hitting it directly and I've just sort of uh, dotted in a few areas of that and that's really I think made a huge difference in terms of the readability of that area so the next thing I'm doing here is I'm sort of sculpting the rest of the landscape in a way that's going to guide the eye towards that area and there are a variety of different ways you can do this uh, one of the ways that I've uh, used uh, one of the strategies I've used here is creating a very literal pathway from the foreground into that distant object. And uh, this is something I do in my paintings all the time. It's not something you have to do quite so literally. Um, if it's not something that your landscape requires, uh, for example, if this is a truly untouched landscape, you may not want to be putting in a road or anything like that. Uh, but it's a really great uh, plot device. It really tells your viewer exactly where to go, and it's a great way to sort of invite them on the journey. So the next thing I'm doing here is I'm using one of my favorite brushes that I've included in the uh, ESA brush pack, which you, once again, you can find a link to that in the description below. Uh, I love this brush. It's the uh, Brush Dabs brush and uh, it's really great for just quickly creating some impressions of more complex textures or uh, sort of rounded uh, uh, features of the landscape. I use it a lot for trees, for moss, for rocks. Uh, in this case you'll see me using it for snow like I'm doing right here. So very quickly and simply I've put, to, I've put down a sort of base layer of greenery underneath where, where I'm starting to indicate the presence of uh, these sort of evergreen trees. I've put down that base green layer and then I'm just going over it with the same brush with a uh, with sort of a snow color which in this case is a uh, the snow in shadow is this sort of neutral grayish bluish uh, tone that I've selected here and then for the highlight areas where the sunlight is sort of coming through and hitting that snow, I'm pushing it very uh, clearly and directly towards the lighter, warmer values that you see in the rest of the snow here. And at this point, I'm already thinking that I want to have some sort of dappled sunlight on the side. So I'm developing that first, but you don't see the, uh, the narrative elements to uh, project that dappled sunlight quite yet. You're going to see me play up some more trees on the other side to help sort of fit the uh, light pattern that I'm developing there. And another thing I'm working on as well, and actually something I picked up in a photo study I did recently, is um, the sort of uh, the, the light bloom effect you will see in the, uh, the more fuzzy shadows. I guess it's not so much a light bloom effect as it is sort of a subsurface scattering that happens with snow. And you'll see that there's this transition point uh, in the snow between the very bright warm highlights and the cool blue shadows that are really picking up that saturated blue reflection from the sky in between those two areas 
there's this neutral zone where actually you would expect it to just be sort of a gray that sort of goes between them and in fact it is a gray but it's a very warm gray <laughs> and it's in when you warm it up when you really uh, you can even push it a little bit into the red and it creates this nice uh, this nice transition point where it looks like the light is uh, as it often does with human skin the light is sort of coming out from beneath the snow where it's not actually hitting it directly or in the case of a sort of more diffused shadow the light is just being spread across a surface and that does give it a bit more of a, a warm neutral tone so uh, anyway the uh, the next thing I'm doing here is I'm just trying to create a bit more texture trying to sculpt this landscape a bit more I'm using my rough comb brush uh, on the uh, the road to give it a bit of uh, some grooves and some texture to sort of make it look like there uh, have been some some vehicles or people uh, sort of going through this area and I'm using my dry uh, thin brush to create some some nice tree stalks here I remember as I was doing this I was very much channeling the inner Bob Ross in me which I feel like has just been so <laughs> has just been just bursting to get out these days. I love Bob Ross. I love all his his work, and um, I've really uh, actually cut a little Bob Ross bobblehead for Christmas. I, I'm gonna have to start featuring that in my videos here. But um, but this technique is I cannot at all claim credit for this. This is so Bob Ross. I'm just bringing it to the digital world. He creates these long thin stalks, and then he uses the brush dabs. To kind of create this uh, this back and forth pattern up the stock and it's just quick you can do it in a few seconds and just creates this really great impression of a uh, evergreen tree here so uh, feel free to use that uh, I, I once again I can't claim credit for it but it's just so satisfying and it's really nice to have to have created a brush that can really uh, deliver that that a similar effect. It's not quite the same as it is with traditional paint But then again with digital it never quite is but I try to get as close to possible To replicating the traditional style in my work and that's sort of what this brush pack is all about Anyway, I'm going through under these trees as well, and I'm just sort of bringing in more of a shadow tone where there's a uh, some areas underneath the branches and underneath the trees themselves that uh, isn't quite getting as much light and I'm just sort of alternating between these these uh, different tones with the same brush so you can put down that shadow tone and then you can put down the greenery the lighter more illuminated greenery on top and then on top of that just like you're just like layering it up like a cake on top of that you have the icing that beautiful snow that's just hanging on to the edge of the branches there and it's just a really satisfying process and I'm glad I got to explore it a little bit with with this piece so next I just want to take these little patches of forest and I want to blend them a little bit in with the the rest of the image and kind of just sort of bring everything together I want it to be uh, fairly cohesive I want everything to be working well together and I, I want it to to look like it's sort of occupying the same world so I'm taking a little bit of that that direct sunlight that's hitting the uh, the snow below the trees on the right there and I'm just putting that up on the on some of the branches there I'm just experimenting a little bit and I don't want to overdo it you can see there I I sort of um, played it up a little bit and then I pulled it back because I feel like it was creating a lot of contrast and maybe a bit too much interest over there and my goal here is 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 not to draw the eye away from that uh, that more or less central focal area which is that building in the distance and already you can start to see that the that distant building is starting to look kind of vague and blurry and maybe not quite as interesting as the trees and the the details i've set up around the edge of the canvas here just because they're a bit sharper there's more contrast i've created more texture with that brush so this is something i'm noticing and something i plan to address as i move forward i'm just saving those nice shiny details uh, on that distant building for the end of this process and in fact I do spend uh, maybe I think the last 30 percent or uh, in other words the last 10 minutes maybe of this painting I think working on those details 
But first, I just want to make sure all this lighting is working well together, and that's why I have uh, started putting in these little uh, streaks of light going across the um, the ground here, and that's just something I, I want to uh, use to to reinforce the dappled light impression I've given on the right side. I thought, well, if the light is is sort of hitting these areas inconsistently, I want to show that in the midground, and it's going to look very different in the midground in terms of shape than it is in the foreground, because in the foreground it's sort of spread across these closer uh, three-dimensional objects, and in the midground it's sort of flattened out a little bit. So instead of these big blotches of light, I'm just I'm squashing it down to these little um, streaks that go across the the road, and likewise with uh, with the little dappled light areas I developed earlier I do want to include a little bit of that subsurface scattering light over there as well so next I'm returning to these clouds and um, you can't uh, actually see it in in procreate at this point well I guess you can now but uh, I've been merging layers down as I work if I ever duplicate or copy everything I'm working all on one layer here and with speed paintings I really don't think it's necessary to do any more than one layer. In fact, with a lot of my paintings, I don't typically work in more than one layer, sometimes two, three, uh, maybe four max if it's a large project. Uh, and then from there, you know, uh, towards the end of the process, if it's a really big project, I may sort of create a whole bunch of uh, different effects layers and sort of experiment with that. But as far as the core painting process, I really try to, to keep it uh, to to th this simple uh, one layer and that's just because I come from a traditional background and it's a bit easier for me to to work that way I also find that it creates a bit more accountability for myself as an artist it sort of uh, forces me to be a bit more confident and uh, a bit more clear in my decision making as I move forward and with speed paintings that's really that's really key you know you can't uh, you can't sort of go back and forth with these different concepts and experiment with different things. You just have to put it down, and whatever you put down, you have to roll with it. And uh, and that's just such a valuable mindset, no matter what the, the length of time it is that you work on a project. Being able to have that, to, to force yourself to have that confidence in your decisions uh, is going to help your work greatly. And that's why I try to include speed painting in my uh, weekly practice at least once or twice a week. Uh, among different, uh, you know, anatomy and landscape and other studies. And um, so I really encourage you to try this process out. Uh, even if it's, uh, even if you don't finish in 30 minutes, maybe give yourself another five or 10. That's totally cool. And then, you know, just set it as your goal to work towards 30 minutes. Or, you know, maybe even do 10 or 15 if you really want to challenge yourself. You don't have to get something perfect. You just have to, to learn as you go and really um, start to develop that mindset that, that will help you gain confidence in your own abilities and your own decisions. And truthfully, you know, you <laughs> even if you're just a beginner you, or, or someone who maybe just doesn't have great confidence in your abilities right now, you may be thinking, okay, that's easy for you to say, Evan. You know, it's <laughs> you have a lot of experience with this kind of stuff. But uh, I think this applies to anyone, and it's um, it's just sort of a, a it's almost like a fake it till you make it kind of thing. You 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 just have to uh, force your yourself to move past your own self doubt, and you can really produce some quite incredible results. You may surprise yourself with what you end up producing doing something like this. I mean, yeah, it may not be as good as something you spent you know four or five hours on but it's it may be better than you expect for a 30 minute or 40 minute session so and and knowing that you know knowing that you can accomplish that much in this short period of time can really set a great precedent for more in-depth work that you do later as you can see i'm also going around and flipping the canvas here and there i'm not doing it too often, but I am doing it, uh, I think, every five or ten minutes during this process, and I think a bit more later on as I start to put the finishing touches on here. And uh, that's just to give myself a fresh perspective 
and start to notice some things that I may have gotten used to that, that are really sticking out here. And uh, I'm also, one of the things you can really see with Procreate, which is actually one of the reasons I really love to use it uh, so much, is uh, you can see me sort of twisting the canvas and rotating it and zooming in and out uh, quite organically as I work. Um, with Photoshop, of course, you can do this. Um, if, if that's something you, you want to uh, work with, I work with Photoshop all the time. You can hit R and rotate the canvas at any time. It's just a little bit less organic, a little bit less intuitive, and of course Procreate is just packed with features like that, you know, that really, uh, that, are, that, that once you learn them become very intuitive and sort of makes the whole process quite a bit simpler, which is why I tend to use Procreate for uh, daily practices and speed paintings like this. So as you can see me uh, rotating the canvas like that and just trying to get a, a different perspective. And it's not just the perspective that I, I get when I rotate like this. It's also uh, the uh, different sort of a, a different angle for the brushes I'm using. And all the brushes I've, or at least most of the brushes I've created for this pack are tilt sensitive and angle sensitive. So uh, for example, there are some that are very thin that you can get a really nice crisp line if you angle it in the right way so uh, sometimes rotating the canvas just a little bit to to get in there and get just the right brush stroke can really go a long way and so I've sort of mapped out the major shapes with this um, this building here and I've made some clear uh, delineations between uh, areas where the building is free of snow and areas where the snow has accumulated and I'm, I'm trying to reinforce that a little bit with some of these textured brushes that I've created uh, just to create a bit of a transition area where some of the snow is clinging to the surface but some of it is uh, just sort of settled at the bottom uh, and I'm just thinking about where it would fall and where the wind might have blown it up against the surface here and of course in the shadow area I'm using a distinct value for the snow even if, even though it is in shadow I want the snow to sort of reflect the uh, lighter value of the sky and be clearly distinct from the darker less reflective value of the building so if you are painting snow or really anything you want to you want to bear in mind relative values between light and shadow so if you have two different values in light you want to make sure that those values are proportionally different in the shadow area and that's that's an easy thing to miss but uh, at this point in the painting I'm starting to get to a, uh, a level where I could call this finished at this point. And uh, in fact, I, um, I, I, I might as well have, I think, if, if I'm being honest with myself, I think the last 10 minutes or so that I spent on this piece was a bit uh, unproductive or maybe just inefficient. You know, I was just sort of messing around with, these, with some different ideas because I could, and I ended up actually just getting a little bit lost in that process and I think at this point uh, if I were to modify my strategy a little bit I probably would have moved away from that building and maybe uh, developed some other areas I could have um, something I do sometimes that you can uh, apply to speed paintings as well as you can take areas and copy and paste them and transform them in different ways I could have taken this building structure and sort of uh, you know copied it put some other smaller buildings around it maybe uh, developed some some other structures around it that just gives it a bit more interest and context. Um, I would have liked to put a little bit more time into the into the cloud patterns, and um, I think uh, actually what I ought to have done is is used some different cloud formations than I have in this piece, uh, just because uh, I, you know thinking about the context. It, this is clearly a very bright sunny day and uh, typically during bright sunny days uh, in winter environments I know this because I live in Vermont which uh, is winter you know for it seems like 90% uh, of a year <laughs> 
uh, it's I mean it's usually it's realistically you know about six months but it feels like forever anyway you know you see a lot of stuff like this and on those really cold days uh, that's when the Sun actually comes out because it's it's become so cold that all the the water has just ceased to become vapor and it's all turned into ice or snow and become very dense and fallen down uh, so uh, you'll usually see a fairly clear sky uh, during those really cold days and I think that's what I started to put together here but I sort of um, messed around with that that atmosphere a little bit uh, just to just sort of for my own purposes and to sort of uh, develop my own uh, design preferences for example I darkened the 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 shadow underneath the cloud uh, by the building there just so that the white of the snow would pop out a little bit more and uh, you, if you know me, you know I like to make it pop in <laughs> in my paintings especially. I like my focal point to pop, and uh, I like everything else to sort of melt away. So, um, you know, that's something you, you, you should always bear in mind, too, when you're developing your, your focal area or any area you want to create contra contrast around or to draw attention to is, you know, how can you not only modify the object of focus, but its context, the the background behind it, the other things around it, to help draw attention to it. Every single element of your painting can be a design device that you use to funnel attention to specific areas. So it's it's definitely something to, to think about uh, as you're going through and especially as you're developing that focal point there. In fact, uh, something I just did there where I sort of created a whole bunch of uh, equal value highlights uh, just below the building on that slope there. I think that was a, a mistake actually. Um, and I, I remember <laughs> thinking as I did that, that it might have been, but I, I guess I just sort of stuck with it. And I may have um, pulled that back a little bit later on, but you see how when I take the same value highlight that I've used on the snow on the building and I and I dragged it down to the area below the building as well, even though like I was thinking at the time, I was like, that's realistic because the sun is hitting all that area equally. Just because it's realistic doesn't mean it's going to work well for your design and your composition. And what, what happened there was I drew that highlight down, I brought it down and it, and it sort of flattened that whole area out. It made the, uh, the building a little bit less important because that, that same highlight value was used uh, in the the blank ground before it whereas before it was a little bit of a lower value it was a little bit more of a sky reflection and it's and like it's totally passable maybe there was a cloud going by you can come up with explanations uh, <laughs> in the process for to justify the design choices you make you know make those design choices first then come up with a, a in-world explanation for it Or, you know, it can always be a conversation between the two, right? Think about um, every painting as a dialogue between what it is you want to create and what the best thing visually to do uh, on your piece would be. You know, how you can use the the basic guidelines of composition and color theory. Things that are, that are just generally more aesthetic and sound as, as design choices. How can you use those to reinforce your story? Or how can you modify your story just a little bit so that you can use those design elements? Uh, it's just a, you should always have a constant dialogue between the two. And you can see there, I also, like I said before, I darkened that cloud in the background as I was working on the rest of them. I just brought that values down a, a little bit around the building, which helps the building to pop forward a little more. And then next here, I'm continuing to play to play with the uh, the streak uh, the streaking light that's going through the pine trees on the well now the left, and uh, I'm just sort of playing up this area and giving it a little bit more clarity. I noticed that my foreground was lacking a lot of shadow values that I uh, that I wanted to to include in there. And uh, that just helps to reinforce that three-dimensional perspective. Uh, and you know, even though in this case uh, we're working with a very bright material, that is the snow, uh, 
it's still often important to include just little hints of that dark, dark value, maybe where the snow breaks away or turns into some other material, or maybe it's just a really deep shadow among that, that snow structure. It's good to include those, those dark values in your foreground somewhere, even in small amounts, because it's really going to tell your, your viewer, uh, and they won't know this consciously, but it will tell them uh, unconsciously that it is a, uh, a closer area, because the shadows closer to the viewer are going to be much darker in value, uh, generally, almost across the board. Likewise, you can see in the distant building that I've put there, I have not included any kind of shadow that even closely uh, comes near the values that I've used for the shadow in my foreground, around the trees, and everything. That building could be a, a dark red or, or any other, you know, really could be black, and I still would not use the same level of shadow there. Uh, because I've put it at a distance and among an atmosphere that will reduce the contrast in that area significantly. Of course, it were, if it were a really clear day, you can sometimes see the shadow will, will come close to the uh, close enough that you may not even be able to, to tell the difference to the values you use in your midground and your foreground. But just as a general rule of atmospheric perspective, they're very rarely, almost never going to be darker. Uh, unless they're in a very different context. So I've also just quickly used the warp tool there because I noticed my building proportions were kind of uh, a little off and the, the perspective wasn't quite working there. And I went in with a... Uh, I went into... I, I kind of realized what I was talking about earlier with the clear sky. And so I sort of... I made this hap, <laughs> haphazard attempt to introduce that a little bit with that uh, color up there, but I end up dialing it back a little bit later. Um, and I actually, you can see I painted over that, that brighter saturated color with something a little, um, a little less saturated because it was just a bit too intense. It was drawing a lot of attention away from the building below. And then I just, I'm using the smudge tool here, which is something I use in Procreate uh, all the time. It's uh, it's the way it's set up in Procreate. There are actually, I think, a couple options for the smudge tool now that uh, didn't exist with the last version, but I've just been using the, the standard, uh, uh, some smudge tools I, I downloaded with some various uh, textured qualities to them. Um, obviously, you can use any brush with the smudge tool, and I just really love how it works in Procreate, and it's really great for blending and for creating clouds and that kind of thing. Uh, I, I still have not quite figured out how to achieve that same effect in Photoshop. You can kind of do it with a mixer brush with the right settings, but the smudge tool in Photoshop is uh, much more pushy. It's uh, It sort of pushes things around a little bit more than it blends them, so um, I haven't <laughs> quite figured out exactly how to uh, replicate that. So it's just another reason I like using Procreate, and I do work slightly differently on Procreate for that reason, but um, anyway, if I'm, I'm, I'm sort of working on a way I can incorporate that into my brush pack for, for people that use other digital painting systems. And then I've, I've uh, sort of played up uh, a little bit of a forest there in the background, and uh, sort of just very lightly, just, just very vague indications of uh, trees and a little horizon line there. And then in the last few minutes here, I'm just playing up some little details uh, here on the building that will just give it a little bit more interest and I just want to sharpen all that up a little bit make sure there are nice shadows uh, underneath the various um, uh, objects that are hanging over make sure the snow is, is looking good make sure all my lines are sort of uh, indicating shape successfully and make sure making sure the perspective is working there but I'm pretty much wrapping uh, this piece up at this point and I think the last thing I will do is sort of just give it a general once over, give it a bit of a, a color balance. I think I ended up pushing the, the warms in the highlights just a bit more and pushing the, uh, the cools in the shadow. And that's just really going to help to create this nice, dynamic, uh, illuminated effect uh, in, in this landscape here. 
So that's all for this video. I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, learned a little bit about how you can apply these techniques to your own process. I highly encourage you to try uh, this speed painting process, test it out for yourself, and see if you can see any improvements in your own work. And once again, uh, if you haven't already, please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and check out any of the links below that I've included uh, about uh, Evident and the mentorship program and the brush pack. These are all great resources that you can use to improve your own artwork. So until next time, I'll see you guys later.